on anthropocentric framework for what for considering what makes life valuable. End quote. At first glance, then there doesn't seem to be an oversight in Butler's work. You know, she's talking about this. Let's talk about life, the precarity of life, in beyond extension of the limitation of just the human subject. So looking at it from a broader perspective. Indeed, precarious, but oh, sorry. Uh, indeed, precariousness by definition insists that we actually do that. You know, precariousness is stipulated on vulnerability. And when we start to think about what is the most vulnerable life, non human animals become central to that thinking. So Butler suggests all of these interesting possible connections between the human and non human animal and social ontology, and then does what with them exactly? Frames of War is a call to the political left, and this is what she does, to reorganize in order to better marshal resistance to war, specifically war in the U.S. and the war on terror, because of all of the human lives lost <coughs> in the war and how they are each significant. But where do the animals go in this call? Why develop the non-anthropocentric tools and not use them? What does this imply? What does it sustain? It is worth quoting her at length from the aforementioned interview that I drew that previous quote from. So she says, if we offer an alternative to the schism between lives that are grievable and lives that are ungrievable, she's speaking of you know, the lives that are lost in war that don't really count, it seems to me that we start with the presumption that human life is precarious life. I could also say that non-human life is also precarious life and that more precariousness Maybe precariousness links human and non-human life in ethically significant ways. When we start understanding our lives as precarious, we understand that we are linked to one another. But how can I take responsibility? How can I assume responsibility if I do not first recognize that link? So this, this idea of recognition is amazing. And for such a radical idea about recognition, there is so much caution in her writing. She says, I could say that the non-human life is also precarious. She doesn't actually say it is precarious. She you know, hedges her bets. It's a rhetorical gesture. And whether that gesture is sincere or um, is a strategy, and to what end, I don't know. I don't know about that, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I will extend this much, um, that because I think generosity is really important in critical work. That perhaps um, this is a preparing of ground for work that she's doing or has done that's been recently published in say the last five years um, is preparing the ground for something more to come. Um, but what bothers me about that is that at some point you have to plant, and I can't help but think of the urgency of the unspeakable suffering of the non human animal, which is just barely visible in frames of war, or to deploy Butler against herself. Suffering that within the text is, quote, jettisoned to a domain of unreality such that specters are produced that haunt the ratified version of reality. So while she critiques the way frames operate in relation to war, that they, quote, institute an interdiction on mourning, end quote, the spectral nature of the suffering haunting her work indirectly affirms that there is no destruction and there is no loss of the animal. And if anybody had the opportunity to go to Julie's presentation yesterday, War Animals in the Aftermath, this is clearly not the case. Not only for non-human animals, but more than human life. So it is this haunting that motivates my analysis and fuels the compulsion to critique cultural studies in particular and academia at large, which Butler text, Butler's text and her work, um, with all of its difficulty, for me embodies. So pervasive within these institutions, and I would argue that Butler at this point is an institution, um, is what has come to be understood as speciesism, which I'm sure most of us are quite familiar with, um, which I am arguing is subtly demonstrated by Butler in this particular text. So while a great work, deal of work has been done to interrogate the power structures that oppress various marginalized groups, there has been a lead, even a refusal, to seriously consider the oppression of the animal even as those structures of oppression operate through similar mechanisms of normativity and framing in various discourses. Um, the opening plenary talking about using analogy and how that can be sometimes problematic um, is an interesting way to look at how these discourses or how these systems of oppression rather uh, overlap, how they, they sync together. Um, people don't want to refer to industrial farming as a Holocaust, but when you think of what goes into the Holocaust, the sort of um, industrialization, the lack of responsibility, the bureaucracy is a big, big factor that nobody actually is making decisions, or so it appears, then um, 
interrogation of uh, these oppressions wherever they occur becomes really significant for all kinds of life. Um, all right, so I sort of digress there and now I have to figure out where I was. Mm -hmm. So, oh, now I'm going to quote my supervisor, Jody Castropano. She has speculated at length on the, the nature of the refusal to look at um, the systems of oppression in relation to animals, not human animals. She says, if we take the time to examine the leg in cultural studies and critical theory, we see that although critical attention has been directed against sexism and racism in critical feminism, queer theory, and race studies, the same intellectual work has also produced all too familiar marginalizing of the non-human, which is exactly what Butler is doing. So she's doing this great work, but at the same time, she's mar marginalizing the non-human animal. So to take seriously the question of the animal is to shift the struggle against oppression from an identity politics that takes as its starting point particular categories, something Friends of War seems to call for, which she does say that you know identity politics are not the solution for um, social just justice, but to, to a struggle that focuses focuses on the way power is used across categories. Um, I've already outlined certain ways that I take issue with the Butler and Reading Friends of War, but have also hopefully demonstrated the great potential I see in some of her ideas. In particular, in particular I suspect that Butler can be deployed to first validate the weight of the acknowledgement of suffering through precarity, and then refigure the ways we respond to this suffering. In furthering this, it is worth returning to Castro and her suggestion that, quote, empathy and compassion have a role to play in the epistemological and ontological shift with regards to animals, end quote, which is a terribly unpopular thing to say amongst academics. Mm -hmm. I understand this as empathy and compassion for both the self, which I think is really important as social justice activists, um, particularly if we are in a position of white privilege. Um, and think of it as a radical kind of love that recognizes the bind, the interrelationality of the precarious nature of life, and responds to that with equanimity. So it is here where I'm going to briefly touch on some Buddhist ideas. It's here that I uh, find a helpful turn to the Buddhist concept of metta, which is simply loving kindness. Um, it is a place that I find useful to deal with the oversight of the friends of war. And metta itself is a way <coughs> for one to, quote, transcend preoccupation with one's own concerns and engages an experience of universal love and caring towards others, end quote. I want to acknowledge that this turn is motivated by my own relationship with the Buddhist practice of Vipassana meditation, as well as an enduring yoga practice, a yoga asana practice. So I've come to the realization that, um, as trite as it might sound, that love is the answer through actual embodied practice, not through reading it in books. Um, which, you know, they do have their place and they are very helpful, but there's other ways to know. Um, it is also a marker of a further attempt to incorporate messy, intuitive, embodied knowledge into my research. And as such, for me, represents a bit of a risk. I'm not an expert in Buddhist studies. Um, you know, I don't read Sanskrit. I can't get to the original sources of where this comes from very easily. Uh, perhaps 15 years from now, if I'm a scholar in that field, uh, that might add some legitimacy to this, but this is, you know, coming from me and my body on the yoga mat in my meditation practice. Um, so what I'm trying to do then is articulate love or the experience of love as a theoretical ethical tool. It is something I've come to know, as I said, through my yoga practice and being in my body, not through academic study, though I'm trying to bring these two things together in as much as I can. Meta has been understood as a multi-significant term meaning, quote, loving kindness, friendliness, goodwill, benevolence, fellowship, amity, concord, inoffensiveness, and nonviolence, and also defined as the strong wish for the welfare and happiness of others. Notably, the other here has never been limited to humans. It is generalized, it is a generalized other that opens rather than closes, that recognizes rather than denies. It is a way of being in the body, my body, that makes room, that believes in enough room. It is a way of possibility and a way to recognize what remains unseen, be it behind the walls of a factory farm or between the lines of a persuasive humanist text or discourse. So in finishing, I'm going to conclude with a really simple Buddhist prayer, which I think, you know, if we can all live by this, then um, it would be pretty amazing. May all be well and secure. May all beings be happy. Thank you. Thank you.